Sounds Good is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. When we were first getting started, getting ready to launch Sounds Good in 2015, making a podcast was hard. But now, thanks to Anchor, making a podcast is not only easy, it is fun. Anchor's creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and basically everywhere else. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Plus, now you can add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. Even if you're an OG podcast like ours, you can record and produce your show like you always have, but use Anchor as your host. You'll save money, have a superior hosting experience, and get advanced analytics. Anchor has everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. We all have a part to play in taking care of one another. And it was this belief, plus the story of a woman who advocated for herself after experiencing harassment on the subway more than 15 years ago, that inspired today's guest to start a global movement to end harassment. Now her organization provides simple, effective training in more than 14 countries to put an end to harassment. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Herbert. I'm joined today by Emily May, the co-founder and executive director of Hollaback, a global organization that works to end harassment. In 2005, Emily founded the organization which provides free trainings on conflict de-escalation, bystander intervention, resilience, and more. And if you are somebody who's always felt like you can't step up to stop harassment that you see on the street or in public because you don't know what to say or it feels scary or you think that you can't make a difference, which I think that's kind of how I came into this conversation, this episode, this conversation will help you feel so much more confident and empowered to step in. Because stepping in to interrupt hate and harassment is particularly important right now because of rising anti-Semitism, discrimination and violence against trans and AAPI communities, and harassment of and violence towards Black Americans by the police. And despite all of this kind of a heartbreak that we're seeing in the world right now, I think you're going to come away encouraged by the number of people who are stepping up to fight against these trends. And Emily shares more about why we can feel hopeful in the midst of this heartbreak. I got to talk with Emily about why bystander intervention is so important, why we can be hopeful about combating harassment, and how anyone can learn to be an effective bystander through Hollaback Steps. You're going to walk away truly empowered to intervene if you witness harassment with just super practical steps that are easier to actually do than you might think. I came away from this conversation just as Emily's number one fan. I love what she's doing. And so let's just jump straight into this conversation. I want to just start with... What is Hollaback and how did it begin? What's the origin story? Yeah, so Hollaback started about 15 years ago wow. with some friends of mine. There were there were six of us total. Um, and we were really just talking about our experiences with street harassment. And as the women in the group told story after story after story, the men in the group were like, what? <laughs> you guys live in a different New York City than we do. Um, and so we'd heard about this woman named Tana Wen who was riding the New York City subway when an older um, raw foods restaurant owning white guy pulled out his penis and started masturbating in front of her on an empty train. And she took his picture with the idea of taking it to the police. But when she took it to the police, they were like, sorry, miss, he's probably already seven or eight stops away. So she put it on Flickr and it went viral. It made it to the front cover of the New York Daily News. Everyone had a story. My boss at the time had a story of this exact guy masturbating in front of her on the subway. And so we were just like, if everyone has a story, why aren't we telling these stories? So we started this little blog back in 2005 to get folks to share their stories and experiences of harassment. And it's just gone from there. Wow. And what were you doing at the time? Like, What was your like day job or, or, or day-to-day life like before Hollaback began? Yeah. I was working at a bunch of different nonprofits. At the time that Hollaback started, I was 
a director of development at a, at a local nonprofit organization working to fight poverty in northern Manhattan. And all of this was really in the background. The first five years of Hollaback was just a blog. It was just a side project. But there was so much energy towards it and so many people so grateful that somebody was out there looking at this issue of harassment. I think, you know, our society at the time and still oftentimes today is only focused on violence and it's physical violence. Um, and we've oversubscribed to this idea that sticks and stones are break my will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But the reality is words do hurt. And people were really excited that we were out there trying to make something happen. And uh they still are. You're so right that this is a valuable and needed thing. And I'm so glad that you are the one filling this need. Uh, and I know that I've learned a lot from you know my brief time paying attention to Hollaback. And you guys just have so many good resources. Maybe we'll just start with this. Like, What is bystander intervention and why is it important in that moment? Yeah. So when we started Hollaback, you know, we started just with this process of sharing stories. And as you can imagine, the stories were tough and there were story after story. And we were like, dang, we started mapping them and we were like, is anything good happen when it comes to mm. harassment? Like, is there anything positive that we can map? Because as you can imagine, you start mapping stories of harassment, it looks like a, you know, like a disease epidemic, like sprawling across the map. And when we read, what we learned is that the one positive thing that happens when it comes to harassment is bystander intervention. Um, but people don't really know how to do it. In fact, at the time when we did this assessment, about half the time, bystander intervention would actually go wrong, right? Somebody would be like, oh, honey, why were you wearing that? Or don't you know those streets aren't safe? You shouldn't have been walking there anyway. And so we thought, all right, so bystander intervention, apparently something that's already working sometimes. Why don't we train people to be able to do it? And effectively, bystander intervention is just people helping people, right? People helping people when they experience harassment. But the deal with harassment is that so often people freeze. They don't know what to do. They're scared of it escalating, turning on them. And we want to get people to really be able to respond in a way that makes them feel safe, but also to respond pretty reflexively, right? In the same way that we see somebody struggling to open a door with a baby stroller, we help them out and open it. You know, if you were to see me like have a medical emergency right here on this show, you would probably try to help me out, even though you have no idea where in the world I am. And so like, we want it to feel that reflexive to intervene when you see harassment. What you did was you looked for the good and then you made more of it. Like you made it better. You made it more efficient. Like that's what we're all about at Good, Good, Good. It's where are the people who are making a difference in the midst of a lot of bad, in the midst of a lot of terrible things? And then how can we create more of that? And I, I love that you did that. That's so cool and inspiring to me. I also love this idea of of making this a reflex. Because I remember when I learned about the bystander effect when I was in psychology class in high school. And I thought to myself, well, this applies to other people, but not to me. Like, that wouldn't happen to me. And then in this kind of situation where like someone is in need in a crowd, like I expected that I would step up and do something. And then transparently, that hasn't always been true for me. And, you know, I, I don't feel like I've been in moments of big crisis, but like for so many little things, I have not always naturally stood up to offer help to a victim. And I feel like I've gotten a little bit better, but I've got a long way to go. And so how do we begin to internally push back against this bystander effect? Well, you know what? First of all, I want to say I feel you. I am the world's <laughs> like biggest wimp, um, which is why <laughs> the five Ds are what they are, right? The five Ds are not like, here's five ways to be like the toughest human on your block. <laughs> like, <laughs> the five Ds are like, here are five really simple, straightforward things you can do, even if you're scared out of your mind and have no idea what to do. The bystander effect is really just this you know, idea of a bunch of people standing around nobody doing anything, all kind of looking at each other like a deer in headlights, which, you know, happens, right? It's a well-documented thing. And a lot of times it's attributed to a diffusion of responsibility. But I think another big factor is people are concerned they don't have enough context. 
and they don't know, like maybe the person next to me knows that this is really dangerous or there's a gun somewhere or that they actually know each other. And this is a really stupid inside joke. You know, like you don't know, um, you start questioning yourself and everyone around you. And usually in the bystander effect, the thing that we see is that the first person to do something will do something really benign, like a whoa, 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 or a what's going on here. And that's when you start to see other people chime in and be like, yeah, what is going on here? Are you okay? Can I help? Like, stop doing that, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Um, but usually that first thing is really simple because people don't actually know. It seems like, you know, harassment would be really obvious. And sometimes it can be when there's slurs or things like that. But sometimes all you see is somebody being really uncomfortable, and so what we teach is whatever your concerns are, whether it's the bystander effect, whether it's your safety, whether it's not having enough context, to actually hold those as true. That is your body, your mind's way of taking care of you. We don't want you just to notice those things and then override them. We want you to notice those things and then incorporate that into what you think you need to do to intervene next. Like, okay, so I'm scared it's going to turn on me. So I'm not going to directly intervene and say something to that person doing all that harassing over there. Or, okay, I don't have enough context. So maybe I'm going to delegate and turn to the person next to me and say, hey, do you know what's going on? You know, little things, right? We want to trust our body and our mind to take care of us. But we also want to realize there's still things that we can do. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. And when we are back, Emily is diving into the five Ds of bystander intervention. She's going to walk us through them. You don't want to miss this. Be right back. Sounds Good is sponsored by Libro FM. Now, if you've been listening to the podcast the last few weeks, you know that I've been using these ad spots as an opportunity to say, here's the audiobook that I'm listening to this week. I want to recommend it to you. I want to tell you what I'm listening to. And a few of you have reached out and you've said, Brandon, you are listening to too many audiobooks, which I don't think is a thing, but I maybe took that into consideration. I haven't started a new audiobook this week, so I'm not going to recommend a specific audiobook. I'm just going to tell you about Libra FM, which is Here's how it works. Libra FM members get one audiobook credit per month for $14.99. That is the same price as their competitor that you've heard about on other podcasts. And you can use that on any audiobook you want. They have literally all the audiobooks. When you download audiobooks through Libra FM, though, you get to help support a local bookstore of your choosing. You keep money within your local economy, you create local jobs, and you make a difference in your community. As a special offer for Sounds Good listeners, Libro FM is offering two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with the code GOOD. That is an exclusive offer. It's a big deal. You can't just get that same one by going on their site. All you have to do is visit their website, Libro.fm, that's L I B R O.fm, and then type in our promo code GOOD to get started with two audiobooks and to help support your local bookstores to help support your community, to help support authors, and to help support this podcast. Sounds Good is sponsored by Bev. Now, what is Bev? Bev is a female-founded canned wine brand on a mission to transform the alcohol industry as we know it. We all know that the alcohol industry is overwhelmingly overrepresented by men. And the reality is that those men, I'm a man, I'm saying this, Those men have largely ignored women at best or objectified them at worst. And so this is the wine brand for the ladies and the good dudes who want to help change that. Now, here's the thing. It's not just that this brand is doing good, making an impact. They are delicious. They have four varietals. They've got Rosé, Sauv Blanc, Pinot Gris, and Pinot Noir. I think that I told you a few weeks ago that my favorite was one of these. My favorite has changed. I'm a little embarrassed. I feel like I put it on the record that one of these was my favorite. Now I have a new favorite. Uh, So I'm not going to tell you what my favorite is this week because by next week, it might change again. But here's the good news. They are all delicious. All Bev wines are crisp and dry, which are my favorite two attributes of wine. They're also a little fizzy, which is super unique, but it's just a little bit. They are super refreshing and delicious. 
They're all zero sugar with just three carbs and 100 calories per serving. And here's the thing, the cans may look cute and tiny, but each can is a glass and a half of wine, which is perfect for when you don't want to open a whole bottle of wine for yourself. And here's the thing, we worked out a special deal for Sounds Good Podcast listeners. You can receive 20% off your first purchase, plus get free shipping on all of your orders by going to drinkbev.com and using the code GOOD20 at checkout. One more time, that's D-R-I-N-K-B-E-V.com and use the code GOOD20 at checkout to get 20% off plus free shipping and to just get a shipment of delicious wine. Did you guys create these, the five Ds of bystander intervention, or are you just super good at teaching them? <laughs> so we um, originally partnered with an organization um, called Green Dot. Actually, they're now called Altruistic um, to do this work once we learned that bystander intervention was the thing. And Green Dot has the three Ds of bystander intervention. Mm. So they have delegate, distract, and uh, direct. And so we took that and we started training using those three Ds and adapted their curriculum to address um, harassment and racial justice and all of these other things. And then we learned from there. And people were like, well, what if you do this? And what if you check in on people afterwards? And what if you document harassment, you know, and all these things. And so that's how it kind of grew over the past 10 years into the five Ds of bystander intervention. I'll really quick read the five Ds and then we'll dive into the first one. But the five Ds are distract, delegate, document, delay, and then direct. And so let's dive into that first one, distract. In a moment of somebody being harassed on public transit, in the streets, you know, in your neighborhood, like what does distract mean? So if you want to create a distraction, it's all about de-escalating the situation. There's lots of creativity here. We've seen so many different implementations of this. A couple of my favorite, one is to start a conversation with the person being harassed. And here the idea is to build trust. And as you're building trust, start to starve that person doing the harassing of the attention that they are so desperately seeking. And that conversation can be anything. You know, it can be like, I love your dress. Or do you have directions? Where's the closest ATM? You look really familiar. Do I know you from somewhere? Um, We even saw a version on TikTok where a guy saw a woman being harassed in a drugstore and was like, hey, you and I, we both know my Aunt Claire. She just happens to be on aisle three. Why don't you come with me? I would love to, to, to you know, introduce you to her again. Mm. And the woman's like, okay, let's go. Aunt Claire, aisle three. Um, and he gets her out of that situation. So lots of different ways that you can, can start that conversation. Um, other forms of distraction, you know, certainly we've seen people dropping things, whether it be pens or water, people move to make sure they don't get wet. Again, just something to create a break in like a heated, escalating situation. I did this training with a group of um, Juilliard musical theater students, and they were like, Miss, if I saw harassment happening, you know, I would just break out in the song and dance. Everyone would pay attention to me, <laughs> and no one would have the emotional energy to harass anyone else. They would just be entranced by me singing musical theater. We're like, Great, go for it, do it. So lots of creativity with distract. I love that because it also seems like one of those things where you can kind of lean into your natural intuition. Like if you're the kind of person who compliments people more naturally, just be like, oh, I I love your purse. I love your jacket, you know, whatever it is. But if you are a Juilliard student, absolutely do, you know, your music thing. Number two is delegate. What does delegate mean? So delegate's about finding somebody else to help. Now, my favorite person to turn to is actually the person next to me, like me. They're a human who as we humans do, probably wants to help take care of another human, right? But unlike me, they haven't listened to this podcast. They haven't been to our training. Um, (laughs) So help them out, you know, like be like, hey, you know, would you mind going to say something? Or, you know, can you document this while I create a distraction? Really kind of just teaming up. A lot of people think of delegate in a way that's like, you know, that's like, oh, it's just giving it to somebody else to do. But I like to think of it more as like a community organizing strategy. Like you don't have to take this on alone. You're not alone if you're experiencing harassment. You're not alone as a bystander. Like let's get some folks together so that we all feel more supported in what's about to happen next. 
the trick with delegate is that a lot of people are like, oh, I know I'm going to get call the police. That's a really good idea. Um, we just advise that unless the person is physically unable to respond, right? In the case of a medical emergency, for example, that you check in with that person before contacting the police. For some people, the police are great. For others, especially communities of color, immigrants, trans folks, the police can really feel like it's making things less safe instead of more safe. So just check in with that person being harassed before you contact the police. That's so helpful. And you just alluded to this one. Uh, Number three is document. Tell me about documenting. So documenting more tricky than people think. A lot of us are in the age where we have seen so many human rights abuses exposed using documentation. It's amazing. But here's the trick to bystander intervention. It's all about supporting that other person. And you just got on camera somebody else's moment of trauma or violence. So what we want you to do when you document harassment is to give it to that person. Give them their power back. Let them decide to send it to local news station or post it on their social media or show it to their boss to explain why they were late to work. People want to do this. They want to publicly share their story and their injustice in the world. It is a healing process, but it's only healing if you have control over it. I just read that book. What is it called? Oh, Such a Fun Age. Have you read Such a Fun Age? I haven't. Oh my goodness. It's this like delightful novel. It's genuinely like a really fun read. I read it in like two days. Um, it, I think it won a bunch of awards. But there is an example of somebody not consenting to their footage being released after uh, an experience of harassment. And it has really real implications for the character in the book. And that was what first made me kind of aware of this. So first of all, highly recommend the book. But second of all, that's a really good caveat. Another thing that I feel like sometimes I get nervous about with documenting is I'm like, oh, am I allowed to do this? Legally, can I be filming this without you know getting every single person's consent. What's the situation on the legality of filming people in public? So legally in the United States, you can film people in public. Public being defined by like streets, sidewalks, parks. You can't film people inside of businesses um, Mm. legally without both people's permission. Um, In other countries though, it's different. In the Netherlands, for example, you can't film people in public without both parties' prior permission. It's really about where you are in public space, but broadly in the US, you're pretty good to go. Is that the same for if you're documenting police? If you're filming a police interaction, do they have any legal standing to tell you to stop? And if they do tell you to stop, can you push back against that? Or what do you recommend in that situation? Yeah, so great question. The police are public servants. Obviously, we've seen a tremendous amount of documentation of police harassment and violence um, over the past 10, 15 years. And uh, the, as public servants, um, you can absolutely document whatever they are doing. They have no right to tell you to stop documenting or to uh, confiscate your camera. Um, the only thing you want to watch out for for the police least, is that you want to make sure you're at a safe distance. Um, the, the risk there is that they could charge you for obstructing justice if you are too close to the incident. But that's actually a good thing broadly to have a little more distance from the incident so that you're able to really get the entire landscape. And then that person can, of course, zoom into the specific incident if they do decide to share it afterwards. But being able to see the street signs, the store names, or the context, the people who are around in that incident can help to support the case anyway. So just making sure you're at a safe distance is a good call. The other safety advice that we give people when it comes to document is if they are scared that somehow the harassment is going to turn on them for any reason, right? Maybe it's the police, maybe it's just the guy down the block who's harassing somebody to do it discreetly, right? There's lots of ways where we can look like we are just writing an email on our phone (laughs) while simultaneously documenting an incident of harassment. We see a lot of people particularly doing this in on public transport where they can be seated. It's much easier to look like you're writing an email when you're seated than if you're standing um, at the angle, right? Um, so, you know, just another thing to, to keep in mind is that there's various levels of it and you don't have to stick a camera in somebody's face in order to document harassment. I feel like all of that context just... 
I feel like empowered me so much more to take that action step because that's something that I'm sometimes a little bit nervous about. So that feels like everything I needed to know. So thank you. Number four is delay. Tell me about delay. So delay is an amazing one. It can be paired with lots of things. It's amazing because it's so simple. It is literally just asking the person if they're okay, what they need to happen Mm. next. So often we see people don't take this step. I think we're worried that like, if we name like, Hey, that was harassment and that wasn't okay. That somehow it's going to like alert the person to the fact that it was harassment. (laughs) Okay. Um, (laughs) Which frankly, they already know. Um, So what we want to do there is call it what it is. What we see time and time again is harassment will happen. Sometimes it'll be quick or passing. Nobody will do anything. And then it's over. The person's out of danger and still nobody does anything, right? And typically somebody can have a certain level of understanding that in, in the active moment, maybe people are flustered or you know they don't know what to do. But the shock that nobody ever comes up to them as like, hey, are you okay? Can actually be more traumatizing for that individual than the harassment itself. And our research with Cornell University showed that as little as a knowing glance can actually reduce trauma for the person being harassed. And that is absolutely something that all of us can do. That is amazing. And, and such a good reminder. I think you call that exactly my concern. I'm like, oh my gosh, if I if I go up and talk to this person, they are going to realize that this was a traumatic moment. I'm like, if I'm feeling this way, of course they feel this way. So thank you for putting words to that. And the fifth and final D of bystander intervention is direct. Tell me about this final step. All right. So I got a bunch of you folks out here who are like, I'm direct. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Because I know a bunch of you are like, all right, I'm going to go up and I'm going to tell this person doing the harassing, like, what's the what? With direct, this focus is the same. The focus is on taking care of the person being harassed. So what you do is you set a boundary. And then no matter what this person comes back with, you turn to the person being harassed and check in on them and see what they need. Here's where direct goes wrong, right? I think we all are very passionate about the fact that harassment is not okay, myself included. I'm writing an entire book about it. Very passionate over here. When somebody is actively harassing somebody else, they are not in their best learning mindset. I'm going to go on a limb here and say they're not in their best growth mindset. So while it can be really tempting to want to educate them as to why what they're doing is not okay, it's ultimately not going to yield much. So set that boundary. You can set that boundary clearly and firmly by saying, she looks uncomfortable. Why don't you step away? Or you're making me uncomfortable. I need you to you know, give her some space. Or that's racist, also very acceptable, right? Whatever it is, it is likely that person's going to come back you, to you with some kind of rah, 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 like, isn't this a free country? Blah, blah, blah. Ignore them, right? Don't get in that back and forth because the focus is on prioritizing that person experiencing harassment. You don't want to get into a back and forth and start to escalate a situation. And then all of a sudden, there's an increasingly escalating situation. This person has two escalated people on their hands instead of just one. And still nobody is turning to prioritize them and take care of them. So set that boundary and then turn your attention away. Don't worry about the back and forth. That is super helpful because steps one through four are all de-escalating. And then number five, you're like, all right, now is my chance to escalate. No, don't. Uh, <laughs> don't do it. Don't take the bait. <laughs> uh, it's so tempting. And, and yeah, get, like go home and tell your friends the story and do that thing where like you just like get mad about that later. Like, like <laughs> you can escalate mentally later if you need to feel that like sense of justice. But in that moment, I think it's so helpful to hear like, this is not where somebody's going to grow. They are not in an open mode. And so starving them of that attention may actually be, it sounds like the thing that will teach them the most. Yeah. And I think it's ultimately the thing that creates, you know, the world that we want to live in. Yes. You know, one of my favorite people, Adrian Marie Brown says, you know, where we put our attention matters. And when we put our attention on the people experiencing the harassment, it creates the world that 
we want, where the people who are most marginalized, who are most often treated as less than in our world, actually have voice and space to do their thing. Okay, so I, I'm looking at my notes right here, and I wrote down this this quote from your site, and I just want to read it because I think it's really powerful. The quote is, "You are powerful." Remember, everyone can do something. At this time in our history, it is even more important that we show up for one another as active bystanders. Research shows that even a knowing glance can significantly reduce trauma for the person who is targeted. One of the most important things we can do is let the person who is targeted know in some way, however big or small, that they are not alone. And I had written down as a question, should everybody who's listening to this get involved? What if you are you know, small? What if you are shy? What if, what if you feel like you don't know things? But it sounds to me like everybody has the opportunity to do something and to take some kind of action to, again, create the world that we truly want to live in. Absolutely. And, you know, if you're small, if you're shy, like there's still things that you can do, right? And I think one of the things that we really recommend for people to do is First of all, identify those reasons why they're scared to intervene. Don't try and just gloss them over, like hold them as true. And then, you know, pick which one of the five Ds that you feel like really responds to both your concerns as well as your personality. Like we're mm. all different. And then try it out, like see how it goes, practice it. It may not work in all different scenarios. It's good to have a backup superpower, as we call it. But just knowing that you've got like, one or two things that you could do when that moment strikes makes a big difference. And, you know, I know there's probably overachievers here who are like, well, I'm going to do all five. But really, it's just about everyone having that one thing that they can do and creating a world where people who experience harassment aren't alone. Like it may still happen, but we don't have to be alone and we don't have to think that we're the only ones who care. That is so good. I, I've got two more questions before we wrap. The first is, I know we just, you know, powered through five of these uh, and hopefully, you know, this will be really helpful for everybody. But I know that you also have a lot more resources. Tell me what else we don't know yet that you could help train people if they wanted to take, you know, a, a bystander intervention course or check out more resources on your site. What are What is the opportunity that we have ahead of us? Yes. So we do a whole, we pop up a whole mix of um, free trainings. We're also out there, you know, training organizations, companies, you name it. And we do trainings on how to respond if you experience harassment. We do trainings on conflict de escalation. Granted, bystander intervention is one form of conflict de escalation. But what happens if it's getting violent and you're the person who's delegated to? What do you do then? We do trainings on implicit bias. We have trainings on resilience too, knowing that you know a lot of us are really moving through this moment in the world and needing to fill back up our cups. How can we do that work as well? So um, come to our website. All these trainings are free. Tell your friends about them, and yeah, let's uh, let's you know make a world that's just a little bit safer. The other thing I would say is that we do, you know, also collect stories of harassment. So you can come to our website, you can read stories of other people's experiences of harassment and their experiences of bystander intervention as well. Um, so that's another opportunity that's out there for folks. I am so excited to dive into more of these resources. And uh, we're going to have to have you back more to like talk about more of these things. As my final question, you talked about this earlier, this idea that the stories of people stepping up as bystanders was the good news that you found in the midst of a lot of of heartbreaking harassment stories. And so I want to ask you, you're years deeper into this journey. You've heard so many more bystander intervention stories. We're at the same time continuing to see, you know, an increasing number or at least seemingly an increasing number of uh, episodes of harassment. Do you feel a sense of hopefulness even still? And what do we have, listeners, me, to feel a little bit hopeful about in this? Well, here's the thing. I do feel hopeful. Because I've been doing this work for 15 years now, believe it or not, started Hello Back when I was a baby. The thing is, is that when we started Hello Back, people were like, harassment, that's not a problem. 
that's just a bunch of hypersensitive people, you know? <laughs> and then we started training in bystander intervention. It was like crickets. We were like elated if we could get 50 people to come to the training. And then like after the 2016 election, everyone was putting on safety pins and we were like, great, now they want harassment training. And uh, we had like 100, 200 people coming to trainings. We're like, this is amazing. Now, five years later, we are still doing this work. And in the past two months alone, we had 130,000 people register for these trainings. So this is like a moment. People are over it. They are over the idea that we're just supposed to not harass each other. (laughs) Somehow that's going to solve the problem. And they're over the idea that we can delegate it to whoever, whether it be companies or the police or the government to deal with this. Um, people realize it's a problem and they're trying to figure out like, what can I do about this? And when you look at you know, the history of how we address violence, the most effective strategies to address violence, the number one most effective strategy is movement building. And that's what this is. This is a bunch of people coming together saying, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to look for new ways to create the world that we want to see. And we're all going to do it together. So I'm actually incredibly optimistic, maybe the most optimistic I've ever been because of this incredible response. Um, And I think, you know, the tides have finally turned for people to fully get it. And I'm just happy that, you know, I got to be here to see it 15 years down the road. That's Emily May, the co-founder and executive director of Hollaback. You can sign up for a free training on bystander intervention, conflict de-escalation, resilience, and more on their website, iHollaback.org. You can also sign up for all of them if you want to. And again, they are free. You can find a wealth of resources and you can donate to the organization to support their work at their website as well. One more time, that's iHollaback.org. Finally, you should also totally download the Hollaback app where you can report harassment you've experienced or witnessed and read the stories of bystanders intervening. The app is called Hollaback with an exclamation point. That's H-O-L-L-A-B-A-C-K with an exclamation point on the App Store and Google Play. This episode is created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. You can find more good news and ways to make a difference in our weekly email newsletter, our beautiful print good newspaper, and online at goodgoodgood.co. This episode was created by Kaylee Thompson and me, Brandon Harvey. This is actually Kaylee's last week at Good Good Good. She has played such a significant role in this podcast being what it is. She's played a huge role in the good newspaper being what it is. And if you've ever loved anything about Good Good Good, it is in no small part because of Kaylee Thompson. We are going to miss you, Kaylee, but we are so enthusiastic and excited about what is ahead for you. So thank you for everything. This episode was also edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Please make sure to hit the follow button wherever you listen to podcasts so that you can get a new episode of Sounds Good delivered straight to your phone each Monday while you sleep. And if you have a favorite episode of the show, please share it on your Instagram stories to share the word about celebrating good news and taking good action. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and commit to finding one way to intervene as a bystander if you see harassment. And we'll be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good? Sound good?